Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. So indeed this is the topic of my talk. So it's microservices insight with microservices. I'll tell a word or two about myself. So I'm currently chief architect at Get. I've been a developer and architect in various companies before. I did microservices in SAP when we didn't do exactly microservices, but we did something that heavily inspired by microservices. And also we get, we are working with microservices. So these are some of the experiences. I'm also a blogger, and I have a blog called Blogger Architectura Tochna. It's in Ebu. I think it's good. So if you're interested in this topic or software in general, just Google and find it. Sorry? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, a word or two about Get. So, if you know Get, is what previously formerly known as Get Taxi. It's an application that helps uh, help connecting suppliers and passengers. So, it started with taxis, but now we are doing a bunch of other stuff. We work in four countries across the world. Uh, we have uh, R and D here in Israel, in Tel Aviv. We have 76 employees. We have a lot of fun and we have a lot of challenges. So, the talk is now in the context of microservices. Microservices became, in a couple of years, the default uh, architecture for new systems. So, all systems are suddenly becoming microservices or starting in mic microservices. It's, so, it's sort of a new default, what until a few years ago was a layered architecture or MVC architecture. And I want to bring some insight about this architecture. So first of all, I went over the internet and I checked all kinds of weeklies and blogs, and I found out the topics that come again and again about microservices, just to see what people are discussing around microservices. So there's microservices with Docker, there's testing microservices, microservices with Node.js, with Meteor, Nginx, etc. Event-driven microservices, security for microservices, and so on and so on. And then, what can we learn about it? Is it possible that all the knowledge we have had up, and up until now is no longer relevant because we need to learn a new everything to do with microservices? We need to program again and design our system again with microservices. So my insight is that first of all, microservices is a hype. Okay, that's clearly so. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad hype, it has much values, uh, many values, but it's a an hype and everyone wants to talk about microservices. So when I went into the article themselves and I've seen microservices with Docker, they mostly wanted to talk about Docker. <laughs> when I read articles about testing with microservices, it's actually about testing. They said you should write a lot of tests, they should run quickly, you should balance between a uh, unit test, and functional test. So these are all the common knowledge that was before. They just try to connect it to microservices. There isn't much new about it. So if you know the core technologies, there isn't so much new about microservices. And by the way, this one is a joke. I haven't seen anything like this. Okay, so the pattern, the first pattern I recognize that is actually happening around this is that you should assume that there are microservices. Don't ask people, it's, it's there. And if everyone is doing microservices, and you want to talk to everyone, so just connect yourself to microservices. So for each presentation you are now on, on doing, add with microservices at the end. So my, my presentation was about microservices inside, but I added with microservices, okay? And now more seriously. It's proven, but I'll also try to give some serious insight in this uh, session. So beware of microservices envy. It's so cool, everyone are doing it. Don't rush or don't find yourself doing it just because it's so cool and others do it. 
be more aware of what are the benefits, what are the pros and the cons, and just don't envy it. It's not a silver bullet. Not everything, not everything is perfect about microservices. So now I want to talk a little about design patterns, microservices design patterns. So I went over the internet and again I collected the most commonly uh, referred and documented um, patterns that are related to microservices. There are circuit breakers and bulkheads that are about stability. There is a single sign-on, distributed tracing, service discovery, et cetera, et cetera. And I also listed here a list of tools that actually implement these patterns and can help you to achieve them faster. Okay, so these are patterns that are worth studying. And I want to remind that no software engineer was ever, ever uh, fired because he implemented all the patterns of a microservices to the system. Okay, because he defended all the aspects of the system from all areas. If he was fired, it was because he didn't deliver any business value to the system. He was just busy with implementing all kinds of patterns. So my lesson of this is that don't eagerly go to microservices. When we started to work with microservices, we had a consultant coming after a couple of months, and he was really into all the details, and you know, he's been in all the conferences, and know all the, all, all, all the trends at the time of microservices, and he guided us the following. He told us, when you start with microservices, first implement an API gateway, this pattern. This is necessary. You should start with it. And we actually had a lot of features the business required for us, and we didn't have the time to implement it. So at first, we felt we are not doing things very well. But now we are almost a year and a half later, and up until now, we didn't really need this pattern. Okay? It's very nice. It, there, are, there is some width in this pattern, but it's not necessarily what you need at the time. <laughs> So first of all, you should ask yourself, what are the pain points? Because all these patterns are sort of indicating of pain points with microservices. So what are the pain points you are suffering? And then find what patterns should or may help you. So I'll just share a little bit of what patterns did we use and when and how to give a picture of how it can be. So we started microservices about a year and a half ago. And when we started, we created a lot, a lot of new microservices to deliver new business value. It was fun. We advanced really fast, and we did a lot of stuff. And only after about nine months of having microservices in the system, we started to have some stability problems, stability that really hurt the business. And then we went to the list, and we said, OK, stability. We have a pattern. It's circuit breakers. Let's Im implement circuit breakers. So we pick a library. We extended it. We implemented across the system circuit breakers. And it didn't help much. It helped only a little. Because it, it wasn't exactly our problem. That, uh, the problem that circuit breakers are helping with wasn't really the problems we tackled. It was similar, but not exactly the same. So we used a pattern. I called it custom star. So it was a custom implementation. We did a bunch of other stuff that helped our stability. We figured out what is the root cause of the problem, and then we found a solution for it. So it's not exactly a, a, a known pattern. Uh, I documented it in a blog post if someone wants to learn more about it. And I, since then, I encountered a couple of other guys that had similar problems. So we have circuit breakers that are helpful. We didn't need them at first place, but later on, as we advance, it becomes more and more relevant. After a, a, a bit more than a year, we started, uh, or we actually implemented some more uh, patterns. The next pattern was single sign-on, because if you know, each service is independent. It uh, has its own logic, its own database, its own Git repository, and its own UI. And then the moment we had 10 or 15 microservices in the system, uh, and you wanted to do some tasks, you needed to log on one after the other to more and more services. And putting in the password again and again was a hassle. It's a security risk. And that's why we put single sign-on that allows to connect one, to authenticate one, into the old services altogether. 
We also started to think about API gateway, but we understood that the monolith we have already is sort of an API gateway. So we extended it a bit, and now it was, and up until now, this is our API gateway, and we are pretty happy with it. So now we are uh, a year and a half after we started. We assume that, I assume that in two months, we will have implementation of API Gateway. So we are starting to implement now because now we have in enough pains in this area. We have more and more clients connecting services directly and this creates latency and uh, issues with synchronization and authorization or all the problems we were told about a year and a half ago. And soon we will probably have our own uh, legitimate, uh, like in the book, certified API Gateway. We're also trying to use containers, okay? So it's sort of a Docker in production. We have Docker in production, but we are not doing it in the classical terms, in the terms of uh, using the resources of the server more efficiently, and we are not doing it in order to make deployment more uh, fast and quick and easy, okay? The concerns and the reason why we use Docker is actually, and this is just a pilot, we're trying to, uh, uh, more or less clarify the responsibilities between, between the developers that will do everything with inside the Docker or inside the container and the DevOps that will do everything outside. And then there will be clear-cut responsibilities between the two. So it's another usage of a common pattern, but we fit or actually found a way it will fit out the most. And we don't know, maybe it will work, maybe it isn't. We are trying. We have some pains with regarding to distributed tracing and centralized configuration. For over six months or so, we want to do it. We didn't find the time, but probably we will. And there are a bunch of other patterns that we actually don't see any use for us at the moment. So all of them are intelligent, they make sense. But in instance for service discovery, use simple DNS and it works properly for us. So we are not trying to do anything further until we will have real problems that the DNS doesn't solve. So not all the problems we, you will tackle with microservices are actually mapped into patterns. So this is just a small story of something we tackled quite uh, as we started. So we had a bunch of services after several months of uh, development. And there is a charging flow. Charging flow is the flow that tells you how much you need to pay. The supplier, the driver, and the passenger. It's two different prices in most of the countries, not Israel. And we need to do it uh, at the beginning of the ride when we give an estimate, or by the end of the ride when we actually do an estimate. And what happened is that we have a service that's called another service, and called another service, and another service, and another, and some services call some other services multiple times because the charging call to the pricing wants to get the driver's pricing and then the uh, passenger pricing. And we have a lot of calls within the network. So we knew or we understood that in one to 20,000 times, we have a TCP connection that is not going to happen. A three-way handshake that is being timed out and nobody responses response, some packet loss or something. And this uh, metric or this uh, fact never hurt us. But the, when the moment we started to do more and more calls, it became more and more uh, possible, or more and more the chance was more realistic that we will tackle these situations. So if before we have uh, services, uh, the probability that a charging operation will be failed due to network latency was none because everything happened inside the monolith. The moment we started to move to services, we suddenly found out that it happens one in 200, 300 times. And this is something that, from one end, it's disturbing. It's not giving good enough service. On the other end, it's pretty tricky to actually detect exactly what is happening or to reproduce the problem, okay? So these are sort, all co sort of problems you will tackle if you start to use microservices. And for this, we, did, we took a number of measures. So we started to, to reduce the call. So if this service called the media service about 10 times, we just made, made a bulk 
a request asking all the keys in in one request. So to reduce traffic, and uh, we did some retries, we did some caches. Uh, we use a number of mechanisms until this was actually solved. Okay, so no clear patterns could actually guide us how would we solve it. We need to, to drill down into the code, into the metrics, into uh, diagnosing and piercing the system and understanding what is the hell is happening and how can we solve it. So, all in all, I would say that understanding deeply what you are doing is much, much better than all these patterns. Okay? If you understand what you are doing and what your problem, you will probably get to the same patterns that some of the elves defined. Uh, because at the end, all these patterns are more or less logical and they are simple. There's nothing so brilliant about them. Okay, so a few more words about the uh, patterns of microservices. Okay, so now it turns out, or it sounds like, that if you have microservices, you need to learn a new set of patterns that will uh, fit to this new era of microservices. But and if you will look a, a, a bit back, you will see that many of these patterns are not new. They are not related really to microservices. So all these patterns here above are patterns that were existing and widely used long before microservices was even started. Some other uh, patterns that I mentioned earlier are patterns that came from SOA, okay, or even maybe before, but they were popular in some other area. And maybe only containers is something that is really new, but containers is something that will probably succeed without microservices, and microservices will probably succeed without uh, Docker or without uh, containers. So the two makes a much reason to work together, but it's not necessarily the only way to go. So what I'm saying overall that all these patterns are actually recycling some old ideas. And the reason that you might have not seen these patterns before, so I know circuit breakers, who knows or used circuit breakers before? Who used bulkheads before? Client-side uh, load balancing. So there are some people using, mostly from the uh, first two rows. But the reason you probably haven't do it is because these are classical patterns of distributed system. And by doing microservices, you are sort of forced to have a distributed system you are handling. And anyone knows what is the first rule of distributed systems? Okay, something is going to break. That's good. I think that's number three. Okay, so the rule I know, the first rule, not Fight Club, but the first rule of distributed system is try to avoid doing distributed systems. The second rule of distributed system is try to avoid doing distributed systems. Because distribu distributed systems are complex and they are hard to maintain. And there are a lot of tricky issues you need to deal with. So if you can do something without distribution, it's probably better. You do it only out of a necessity. And then there are, something will break, it will break Friday night, most of the times, etc., etc. Okay. So then we go back to the system. So uh, we said that microservices are not necessarily good for everything, that it's distributed system, so it has some complexities and some prices. So why do we need microservices at all? So generally, there are two motivations, two major motivations that would usually justify using, using microservices. And if you don't have any of this motivation, you probably need to consider some variation onto uh, microservices and not full-blown microservices in your system. So the first major motivation for getting into the world of microservices is actually because you need a continuous deployment to your system. You need, probably you need to do it because you have A-B testing, and A-B testing is a core business need. If you have a product managers that are very smart, but they do not trust themselves that they know better than the user what should be done, and they actually try to test everything. Every uh, assumption they have about the product, they want to test in production and do A-B test and actually make an experiment that proves or uh, uh, a proof that is not a better feature, 
then you probably get to the need for continuous deployment. And now, well, the moment you have a monolith, and it's layered properly, and all the code is nice, but you need to deploy it all the time, it becomes much harder. Because let's make, let, let's assume you had a change in the business logic. And now you want to, uh, to deploy it in production and start an A-B test where this, this logic is somewhat better. But then the persistency layer or persistency team will tell you, come on, we cannot go to production because we have a bug here. So wait a few minutes or a few days until we fix it, and only then let's release it. And then we have the UI. So the UI uh, is very, very complex, and they don't also want to release it now. They want to do some regression testing. So if you need to deploy your code, although you made a very small change, you need to do the whole regression on the UI that recently changed. That may take several days. And then instead of making deployments all the time, and uh, f several times a day, you probably can do it only several times every couple of weeks. Okay, and this is a limitation to businesses that, as the core business processes, want to do A/B testing all the time and change the system and test it with changes all the time. The way to do continuous deployment much better is actually split the system into services that are fully independent. And if you want now to release four services in this deploy, but one service actually has a bug and it's not possible to deploy it, so deploy the rest of the services and just skip this one until the next release. So deployment becomes much more fast, uh, becomes much faster. If you have some service that needs a lot of regression testing, do regression test in this service, but still you can uh, continue and deploy uh, and not do all the regression testing to the other services where the changes are really minor. So one uh, level of uh, isolation is actually the ability to decide which services will be deploying this version and which wouldn't. wouldn't. Another level, which is sort of a heaven for A-B testing, is actually deploy everything all the time and don't keep anything between the versions. Each service has its own life cycle, its own versions. It's a nightmare for operations maybe, but a blessing for A-B testing, and it can bring real value. So the only way to do it is to break the system into small pieces that are business-oriented, and you can deploy them again and again all the time. Amazon, for instance, have 100,000, it's imaginary, services as, as part of the system, and they deploy every 10 seconds. It's not that all the systems are being deployed every 10 seconds, but if you have so many services and deploy many of them once or twice a week, that becomes a deployment 10 times a second, and they can do A-B testing about everything all the time. So, so far, that was the first motivation to adopt a microservices architecture. The next major uh, motivation to adopt microservices is about development scalability. Development scalability is not really about how much traffic your system handles. It can handle tons of TPS with a monolith. There's no uh, restriction about it. It's actually about how many developers you have and how, how fast your company grows. Many of the companies that actually triggered uh, the trend of microservices are companies that move very, very fast and needed to handle this growth. In Get, when I arrived Get a year ago, uh, uh, there were about six, there were exactly six server developers. Now, a year after, we have about 30 server developers. So how do you handle so many new faces, minds, and heads in your system that don't know the system, need to code all together, and don't need to clash with one another? So the, the idea how to scale your development team is actually breaking the system into services. And each service, as we said earlier, is independent, and each team or a couple of people can take care of a service. Sometimes it's a two person on a service, sometimes it's a person handling several services, but as long as the code bases are small, it's much more possible to scale. And one of the rules of microservices is that the services are always small. Even if your system grows, and let's say this is my system, and after six months it's much bigger because I need a lot of lines of code to bring in more features, I just create more services. 
it's not that my services will go too much. If a service go beyond some limit, let's say 3,000 lines of code, or 10,000 lines of code is if Java, it's just an internal joke of Ruby. Uh, so you split it into a new service, okay? And then you always keep your services small enough. And the boundaries, it really depends. There are all kinds of trade-offs, but let's assume that we have the microservices, which are 1,000 lines of code, and some MIDI services, which are up to 3,000 lines of code, okay? And you don't necessarily need to do everything microservices. You need to adjust to what, what works best for you. And then the moment the code bases are small, it's much harder to get it messed up. So a, a, anyone developed a, a system from scratch lately? Okay, so when you s start from scratch, the code is really beautiful at the beginning, right? It's really nice, everything is so perfect, you want to frame it and put it on the wall, this is how code should be written. And then you continue to code it, and after three months or so, you know that there are some glitches in the code. Yes, it's still nice, but it's not perfect, because the code has grown, it, it's now more complex. And then after six months, usually, you ate the code, and you just want to throw it away and rewrite everything. Okay, and this is just happening because code bases uh, that are small are really easy to maintain. And the moment, or as long as the code base goes, it becomes more complex to handle. <laughs> and then the idea here is to keep the code bases so small that it will be really difficult to get them ugly code that you really want to throw away. And when you do, and it will happen, so some of the people, uh, some of the system is that you plan to rewrite it once in a while. Because if it's 50,000 uh, code line, uh, 50,000 lines of code code base, it's really difficult to rewrite it altogether. You need the management to stop uh, developing for some time just for the rewrite. If it's 2,000 lines of code, yeah, so it's easy. Just rewrite all the time. So one of the ideas of microservices is that you design or plan that some microservices will be written, rewritten along the time, and it's fine. The moment you have microservices and you just comply to the same interface, you can run the older version and the new version side by side, check that everything is going okay, and then throw the older version. And so this is part of the process. Another aspect about uh, uh, R&D scalability with microservices is about the isolation between the services. So in theory, you could say, okay, I have a system, which is a monolith, and inside I have a modules. And modules are exactly like services. What's the different? They are well-defined, they are small, each of them are a few, few thousands lines of code, and we have clear uh, uh, restriction which module can be uh, called to other modules. And then we have a microservices like in a monolith. But what happens next, and this is much about human behavior, it's nothing logical, is that uh, there is a quick fix you need to put it into production and bang, you create a new dependency that it wasn't needed. So in most systems, it's very easy. You just click an import, and now you have reference to the new object. And then there is another sprint that you're not managing to do all the deliveries on time, and you don't have to time to do it properly, and bang, you have another. Uh, dependency that was not planned, that is not really uh, elegant, but it's working and it allo uh, allows you to progress, and then another, and another, and another, and at the end it becomes a mess, okay? A mess and the code that is difficult to maintain, spaghetti-like, etc. The only difference with microservices is that this is more difficult to do, because I I if in a monolith, uh, uh, using a new reference is just in the reach of the hand. You just use it in Ruby, or you just add another import in some other languages. When you have microservices, you need to create a new API. And a, a system uh, of microservices, which are distributed, cannot call another entity without defending them itself if this remote entity is not responding or responding slow. So you need to add circuit breakers or some other defenses against the consumption of the remote API. And then the effort of adding a new API, in one way, it's a disadvantage. disadvantage. You need to work harder. But on other terms, it's an advantage because you don't do it easily. You have more time to consider, is it really the right move? Is it really make sense to do this API? And this extra 
uh, mileage you need to take in order to create APIs help us as developers keep our system cleaner because we don't do things in a rush. We need to think a bit more before we do it. And sometimes this extra time, you need to think and consider if what you're doing is, is actually the right thing to do, make us behave better. So this is about people behavior or people psychology. So this is another advantage of having microservices. So all we need to care are actually at the system level is that the APIs between the services are right. The code bases themselves are so small, so they are not likely to get messed. And if, even if they, they get messed, we will rewrite it sometime. Okay? And this is the way to maintain a large system that grows all the time and keep it maintainable. Uh, there is a saying in English that fences make good neighbors. So although you, you and your neighbor are nice people, and you know exactly where the boundary is, actually the physical fence help better behavior. In the same manner, when, uh, so it's not sound that's nice, but, uh, but when you don't share memory between the models in the system, it helps you to behave better and not to breach the uh, designed uh, restrictions of your architecture and where, what the models do, should do and should not do. Okay, so a few takes from that. So first of all, microservices has benefits, but it has some downsides as well. Uh, what's happening with microservices is that actually you are building a system that has, has sort of a complete picture. This complete picture is sometimes about monitoring or logging or some business insight you need to gather. And the moment you shred it into many, many pieces in microservices, you, you find yourself again and again building it again. And then you say to yourself, okay, I need the old picture, and I broke the system into small pieces, and now I'm working hard to bring back the old picture again. Why am I doing it to myself? Why shouldn't? And several times I had uh, people coming to me and said, come on, why shouldn't we put all the microservices in one server with shared memory and allow them much further access because all this building the old picture is an effort. So this is the downside of actually having microservices. Uh, we have network sensitivity because everything or so many things happen across the network, so we need to be more aware and more careful about, about the network. And the network, at least in Amazon, it's so, sort of a jungle. It's not really an, a network. Everything can happen. Latencies can go up and down, uh, error rates, jiggles, jitters, whatever. Uh, the last thing is about development overhead. So when you create a microservices ar architecture, you need actually to spend more times and create more lines of code to get the same uh, sort of business value you otherwise needed in a monolith. There's also performance overheads. So because you need to connect to remote entities and handle this remote connection safely, it takes more time and more performance <coughs> around it. Uh, so, so, so there are some guidelines. One of the guidelines, so one person I know came to me and told me the following story. I'm starting an, a, a new uh, startup. I'll be do 50% of my time, I'll write code, and it's only me and a friend. How do we start with microservices architecture? So starting with microservices architecture this phase is not, doesn't make much sense because you're going to spend more time to get the same value and it's only you. You don't have to create fences between you and yourself. You don't have problems of uh, actually delivering to production one code base that is so small. So the general guideline or best practice is when you start a new system, even if you intend to do microservices, start with a monolith first. And only when the system gets to some degree or some size, only then start and breaking it into microservices. It's not really good to have microservices for a very small system that is just started. So another thing is to remember that microservices is, is new and there are a lot of hypes and excitement about it. So question everything because many things are wrong and, or at least wrong for you and not everything that works for some famous company will necessarily work for you. And probably if we will meet uh, in 10 or 50 years, 
nobody will do microservices. There will be the next trend. So it's not forever. Okay, like SOA was a big buzz, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, and now nobody wants to touch it. So microservices is for now. So if you do it properly, it's probably beneficial, but if you're doing it just to have microservices, you probably didn't gain much. Uh, make your own variation, take nothing for granted, and allow yourself. This is the hardest part. This is really difficult. Allow yourself not to do microservices, because if it's not right for you, just skip it and find a better architecture for yourself. Facebook and Etsy and all kinds, there are a variety of very famous and successful companies that have seen this trend and decided we are do not doing microservices. It's not right for us. And this might be a wide choice in some in some cases. So just a summary of this all. So you may have a system that you don't really, really like, okay? And you have, you call it the monolith, okay? It was a MVC before, but now it's called the monolith. And now you want to break it into small services, but you may end in the case that you have a, sm a small systems or a small units that you don't really like either. So not necessarily breaking the big bucket into smaller, will make you love your code or make it more efficient. The moment you do it with understanding, driven by the business need and the actual needs and the actual pain points, you are much more likely to get to something you really liked and that is really beautiful. And something you can really say, okay, I like it. It worked for me. I did it right and I see the real benefits around it. So this is my, gui my guidance, my insight from the microservices and I wish you all good luck implementing microservices.